Fort Griffin. A quarter million longhorns pass through here every year on the trail north. But that was a hundred years ago in the days of the Texas frontier. Today's longhorns, Marlboro 100s in the big gold pack, or famous Marlboro flip-top bucks. The longhorns, new Marlboro 100s, so you can spend a little more time in Marlboro country. It was no joke on April 1st, 1970, President Richard Nixon signed legislation officially banning cigarette advertising on television and radio. The Marlboro Man, relegated to print, and it's what's up front that counts was an ad man's dream that withered away. It saved a lot of lives over the years, but thanks to the internet and some crafty marketing, we might be facing a new law soon that would do almost exactly the same thing. Our guest is one of the most successful brand marketers, corporate client specialists, motivational speakers, and triathletes on the scene. You put them all together. It's a pleasure to welcome Mike Ween back to Midpoint. Hey, Mike, how are you? Great, Ed. It's good to be back. You also, sir. Let's bring you in on this and take you back to 1970 now, because there are a lot of people who would look back and go, seriously, there was a big deal being made about just taking cigarette advertising off the air. But for that moment, that was historic, was it not? It sure was. It was, you know, the government coming in and really basically telling businesses that they could no longer sell their product using television. And I'm afraid to tell you I'm old enough to remember the Marlboro Man. Now, it made a huge social impact, but did it make, because a lot of the commercials we saw were fun, they were entertaining, they were the very macho man. Did it make a big dent, though, health-wise immediately, or did it take time? You know, I, I can't. I, I think there there were a whole bunch of factors, Ed, that came to play. Uh, certainly, the negative uh, announcements that cigarette companies had to put on their packages, taking off the advertising. I think it was a whole bunch of things. And then, you know, the the the, the whole education of the impact of smoking and secondhand smoke. So I don't think you could just pin it to the taking off national advertising. Well, but we are looking at something a little different here if you think about it, because we now live in a society where. We have the smokeless tobacco that's out there. No, I shouldn't say smokeless tobacco. Well, maybe even we put that in there, but we now have the e-cigarettes that are out there, the electronic cigarettes, and there's a lot of discussion about what kind of impact they have. Brand-wise, when you look at a lot of these e-cigarettes, Mike, and as they push them forward, are they succeeding in, in the way they're going after trying to make this a, a smart cigarette, if you will? Well, you know, is it a smart cigarette, or is it, you know, they've, they've taken, they still have the nicotine, but they've claimed to have taken most of the carcinogens out of there. So that is a huge advantage. But it's still, if you take a look at some of the advertising that they're doing, uh, they are very talented individuals and they still are developing a great, you know, a positive image. Uh, they're making smoking, whether it's vapors or, or, or cigarettes, uh, a cool thing to do. And uh, I think that they've been uh, very crafty at what they've done. Is that still what we're looking at? Let's dig into that craftiness a little bit there, but how they get to it. It's it's still, no matter whether you look back in the 70s or whether you look here into the, the 2015s, isn't it still about making it the sexy thing to do? Well, you know, it's the difference between cigarettes, and I'm not a smoker, so, you know, I'm doing this from, you know, just an, an op opinion here. Um, the difference in smoking and the difference in brands is all about the image that they're creating. And, and you know, that's the greatest differentiator. And, and Marlboro, which you showed earlier, was a great example of that. Um, and, and, you know, I think that they continue that. That's their point of differentiation. So how is that, how does that marketing differ, though? Because if, if you look at it, because I know that you're big on brands and how they create these brands, the brand that they created back in the 70s and the brands they're creating now, how does it work? I mean, it's got to be working differently to ages, correct? Because still in many ways, they're going after the younger audience. It doesn't seem as if, though, they're, ex they're succeeding as much as maybe they might have years ago. Well, they probably aren't, and one of the reasons is, is they're not on television. And I think that that was one of the effective de decisions that was made. The, the reason why the way they go after younger people is that that's where smoking starts. And, you know, that's where the new people come in. And whether it's teenagers or it's uh, young people in their 20s, or if it's unfortunately people in their, you know, 15, 16 years old, that's where the new people are. That's who they have to attract. That's who they have to get brand loyal to their specific brand. They, they took it off of television, Mike, and, and that certainly made a, a huge difference here because many things changed. 
But now they don't have it in movies. We don't see it in, certainly in television. But we're starting to see, and I've noticed this recently, that we're seeing a lot more cigarette use in movies even. And you didn't see that for a long time here. Is it just, is it sort of sneaking back? And are they trying to rebrand, remarket, maybe uh, try and recapture some of that, uh, that old image that maybe they've lost and a way to get it out there? As I said, I believe that there are some very talented people in the cigarette industry. There's a whole bunch of money you know, going on this. One of their great differentiators is the image that they create. And they create those images at best, you know, visually. And certainly, you know, movies is one, the internet is another. Um, and even look at what they're doing with e-cigarettes now. And because the laws haven't been defined so much with these cigarettes. Is that the thing too, Mike, that we need to look at is these laws really have not been defined with regard to the e-cigarettes. They're out there. You still have people saying they are less dangerous, if you will, than the actual tobacco product itself. But still, there's a whole lot of research out there, and it doesn't make a difference who you are. You're seeing that it works, and maybe it doesn't work. You're seeing it's good, maybe it's not bad. There, there's still a lot of confusing information out there, isn't there? Yeah, and I'm afraid it's driven by who funded the research. Um, but I think that, you know, if you take a look at e-cigarettes as replacement therapy, uh, you know, that probably isn't the, the real direction. Um, and that's probably not what the advertising, while it, it may look that that's what it's communicating, it probably isn't. Um, you know, if, if we're serious about getting people off nicotine and not smoking, I'm not sure if e-cigarettes is the right way. My guess is, is that the Someone in the federal government is going to have to take a look at that and compare it to the rules that were passed in, as you mentioned, and on this date in 1970. Michael, and, we and have that are, are we going to look at a point very soon to where we're going to see a lot of the same bans? And again, in your opinion, and looking at the way this is going with TV and what is now radio, satellite radio, but a lot of those advertising bans in for e-cigarettes eventually? Well, you know, my guess is they're going to make it consistent. Um, you know, e-cigarettes, you can argue what the purpose is. As I said, is it replacement therapy or is it, you know, getting people comfortable with smoking again? I'm not quite sure, but my guess is that we've got to make the laws consistent with both. And it would seem as if there's a lot of people thinking about those consistent ads. And, and by the way, one thing I found out that was rather interesting, and I happen to know this, uh, Richard Nixon, the guy who basically busted all the ads, he used to smoke pipes like crazy. He smoked eight bowls of pipe a day. So he was not exactly somebody who was totally clean as well. Here's a guy who went after cigarettes and smoking, and he was a smoker himself. Mike, it's a fascinating interest to watch here to see what happens when it comes down to marketing these new products. We'll continue to watch. Mike Ween, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me back, Ed. Pleasure. Take care. The novel that may be predicting the world's future. Let me give you a hint. It's not exactly what you would want, and it is not utopian. That's coming up next right here on Midpoint.